Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is another live stream episode, so might look a little bit different, but I'm your host, Parker Setacase, and this is a podcast about, well, uh, this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This is already a special episode because it's live, but it's also extra special because I have with me again, Dr. Chad McIntosh, and we're going to be going meta on natural theology. We're going to talk about uh, classical arguments for God's existence and recent work that gets overlooked. Uh, Chad has just published two articles on such topic, so uh, I'm really excited to go in with him on that. I don't know how long it's going to go. Um, I, I doubt it's going to be the four-hour one, like Cameron's, but uh, maybe we can get um, Joe Schmid to do a, like a 24-hour episode talking about ours. That would be epic. But uh, as we get going here, uh, thanks for everyone who will be watching live. If you want to ask a question, Super Chats make it really easy to see. So if you want to do that and support the channel, that would be huge. We'll try to get to all of those. Just send them in whenever um, because we're going to be going through different arguments. So if you want it, if you have an ontological argument question, do it. Do it then. Uh, you can do it at the end, I guess, too. We can come back to it, but do it when it makes sense, I guess. And uh, if you're watching after, not live, uh, if you're watching after, you can do a super thanks around here somewhere, down here. Uh, if you like the channel, if you like the arguments, if you like Chad, you like me, you like this content, please consider doing that. And then uh, um, if you like this channel, you want to see me stick around and not just go full bore on the Parker Swamp channel and give my life to frogs, then please consider becoming a Patreon patron and uh, supporting the channel. You can find the link in the description wherever you're getting this at. So without further ado, let's bring in Dr. Chad and let's get in deep going meta on getting in deep going meta on uh, natural theology. Chad, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast, man. Yeah, hey, thanks a lot for having me, man. Going deep and going meta. I mean, those are almost like opposite directions, right? <laughs> I, I was trying to think about where yeah. do you go when you go meta. Yeah. Um, well, dude, this is awesome. Your your stuff has been so good, and uh, you're like the argument for God guy now. Like, how, how'd that happen? You know, I told this story before, but when I became a Christian, I was impressed when I first encountered theistic arguments and as i kind of tr you know traced them through the literature i kept encountering more and i was like oh that's kind of cool and so i would bookmark that one and, yeah. and over time i came up with this master list of theistic arguments on my blog and it just got so unwieldy hmm. that i took it down and i had so many requests so like where'd that go where'd that go i was like you know what i really need to get serious about organizing this literature and that's really all, all I'm doing here. I'm not doing anything particularly, you know, uh, novel or original. Mm -hmm. I'm, what I'm doing is just imposing order on this vast literature. That's that's basically it. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then uh, Joe comes along and does 12 hour videos in response, which is <laughs> which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah uh, I had I had something to say about that video. Uh, maybe uh, I don't. What do I? How do I describe? Uh, maybe it wasn't the kindest words, I, I, I guess. Uh, yeah. uh, Tyler McNabb and, and uh, De uh, Michael DeVito had me on recently to talk about theistic arguments. And I and they asked me explicitly about that video. I was like, what do you think? Oh, nice. Uh, so if you want to know what I thought about that video, why don't you go over to yeah. uh, Furthering Christen Christendom when that, when that episode drops. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, awesome. I will, I'll try and find that and put in, uh, a link to in the description to it. Yeah. But, uh, Chad, as we get going here, man, uh, we're going to be talking about natural theology. And so first things first, what do, what do we mean when we're talking about natural theology? Yeah, natural theology is somewhat of a dated term these days. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it, har it harkens back to a time when philosophy and theology had a much cozier relationship than in, in the academy than, than it, they do today. You know, the uh, natural theology did refer to the branch of theology concerned with what we could know about God's existence and attributes, uh, basically by reason alone, or maybe throw in some testimony uh, there as well. So yeah. uh, just based on uh, not in reference to anything by special revelation. Uh, what can we know about God uh, without depending on special revelation? But, but as I say, what goes by natural theology today is really just the philosophical enterprise of giving arguments for mm. theism and, and theism being the view that there's a personal God, a concrete being, not like an abstract object or an idea. Uh, so a personal God like that worshiped by 
Jews, Christians, and, and Muslims. So the term natural theology, uh, it, it's better than the term natural theology to get an idea of what what the substance of the of that branch of philosophy is, is, is really just theistic arguments. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I kind of like to think of it this way. Theistic arguments is uh, they're like the poor kids caught up in a nasty divorce between <laughs> theology and philosophy. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Analytic philosophy, like they sort of took custody of, of theistic arguments yeah. while theology sort of ran off and pursued this illicit affair with continental exotic. <laughs> uh, so, so it's really a branch of analytic philosophy uh, that just that it's it's better thought of as just theistic arguments. Uh, hmm. what, what is a theistic argument then? Well, it's any argument for the existence of or rationality of belief in or commitment to a concrete being with at least one godlike attribute. I think yeah. that's what a theistic argument is. Okay. And when you think of like philosophy of religion, um, is that is that the subject matter or theistic arguments the subject matter of philosophy of religion or or is that too like too vague of a a branch? No, it'll be a subdiscipline of philosophy of religion with the proviso that uh, there are a lot of arguments that would be classified as a theistic argument that really just are just straight up metaphysical arguments or uh, they properly, they just as properly belong in metaphysics or epistemology and then philosophy or religion proper. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and in fact, this kind of reminds me of a great quote in, in Leibniz. He's writing uh, this letter to, uh, I don't know, one of these royal princesses or something. Always. Yeah, always. And, and yeah. he says, uh, he's got this great line. He says, metaphysics is natural theology. Hmm. Uh, I really like that. So. Wow. I like that too. That's good. Um, okay. Well, uh, Man, for those who don't know, you did this uh, epic uh, live stream with Cameron Bertuzzi on capturing Christianity for like four hours. I think it was like 150 episodes or 150 plus, something like that. Uh, arguments for God. How how many theistic arguments uh, are there? I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's surely a lot, though. I mean, this is an interesting feature of this literature. Uh, there are just so many theistic arguments. And uh, I mean... Think, think of it in contrast with with most other positions in philosophy are just supported by maybe a few main arguments and and then you get sort of epicycles on those main arguments yeah uh, and but theism is different and you know theism enjoys the support of literally dozens upon dozens of arguments uh, and so it's hard to keep track of them all I mean you can you can kind of get into the weeds and and think hard about you know, independence between probabilistic independence between arguments and all that stuff. But yeah. I think it's just beyond dispute that there are just vast hordes of theistic arguments uh, that go that stretch all the way back to the, you know, the origin of philosophy itself. Yeah. Uh, so, as I mentioned, you know, what I've tried to do is impose order on this vast literature. Uh, and and so I found it helpful to, to distinguish uh, it, at the most like broad level, two different categories of theistic arguments. On the one hand, we have uh, a bunch of categories here that are just sort of like more traditional arguments. These would be like cosmological, ontological, design, uh, moral arguments, arguments from miracles, um, arguments from religious experience. And then we have pragmatic arguments like Pascal's wager. But then on the other side, we have this whole other group of lists, uh, a, a list of a list of uh, theistic arguments that just, for lack of a better term, just called non-traditional arguments. You know, we have yeah. metaphysical arguments from like abstract objects and other metaphysical entities. We have nomological arguments from the laws of nature, axiological arguments from from non-moral species of value. So th th this will be like deontic value, mm -hmm. uh, aesthetic value, and so on. Then we have noological arguments. Uh, comes from the Greek word nous, meaning mind. So mind-related phenomena like consciousness, knowledge, yeah. things like that. Those are the that. good ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, linguistic arguments. Uh, these are arguments from facts about language and semantics. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, anthropological arguments. The classic example here would be the argument from desire, uh, argument from like meaning of life, things like that. You know, like human human-centric type arguments. And then finally, we just have like this broad category of meta arguments. You know, uh, Ted Poston likes likes to use the phrase the argument from so many arguments, cumulative style arguments. Uh, yeah. And and you could throw in there because uh, 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 I know you're a good old uh, reform boy. You throw in there the transcendental arguments. Too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's got to fit somewhere. Um, yeah. So uh, 
uh, Digital Gnosis is already asking some questions, which, which are great for this uh, this part right here. So I'll just I'll pull some up. So what's the purpose of natural theology, according to Chad? Uh, is it to make theism like rationally permissible or compel everyone to believe? Uh, what and, and to what degree? What, what do you make of that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, uh, I mean, you often hear that nobody believes in God because of the arguments. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's false, uh, but, you know, it kind of assumes the main purpose of theistic arguments is to just convince the non-believer. Right. Uh, but there are other purposes of theistic arguments as well, if, if you're pessimistic about that goal. Um, theistic arguments can grant one rational permission to believe in theism, uh, as was the case uh, for me. Uh, I didn't come to believe in God on a basis of arguments, but after encountering arguments, I felt like I was in a position to take uh, theism seriously. Okay. Um, so uh, you might think that theistic arguments can increase the believer's justification or even yeah. the non-believer. You know, like if even if the non-believer starts at the probability of theism below is below 0.5, theistic arguments could slowly move him toward that 0.5 threshold. Yeah. Uh, theistic arguments are important for being able to defend what you believe if you believe in God. Um, if you're a Christian, you are actually commanded to be able to defend what you believe. So right. theistic arguments would be uh, important in that sense. So there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of there, there's a lot of uh, uh, purposes for natural theology and theistic arguments. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, Chad, do you have like do you do you find a, do you make a distinction between causes and reasons for belief? Like do, he's like uh, I don't know, man. I am a good reformed boy, so I would I would want to say. Uh, like the Holy Spirit caused me to believe, but he, but he used secondary means. He didn't force me or didn't go against my guidance control or anything, whatever mm -hmm. your, your particular view of free will. Um, but then I, I also have like, I have good reasons. I have reasons that I continue to believe. Uh, so when you say like, why do you believe? I'm like, well, there's a couple different answers that I could give there. Mm -hmm. do you, what, what do you make of that initially? Well, I'm a little uneasy with the idea of being caused to believe something by God. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that kind of bristles my free will, uh, <laughs> tendencies, but, sure. um, but I, as far as, uh, having multiple reasons to believe and, and not falling back on any one main yeah. reason or something like that. Yeah. I'm like, th let a thousand flowers bloom. I, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good. That's mm -hmm. good. Well, letting the, the thousand flowers, I'll, I'll do another one from uh digital gnosis here. He says, how many, how many of the arguments in Cam's video does Chad think are independent? Um, and in light of this, you know, do you really like regret plugging 150 uh, into the base spreadsheet? No, I'll, I'll take those in reverse order. No, I don't <laughs> regret plugging 150. Look, we're just we were just playing with numbers in that. Mm. Uh, I mean, do, do you do you regret uh, just playing around with with numbers on a calculator? I don't know. Mm. Uh, it seems like kind of an odd thing. Uh, no, I wasn't endorsing any one way to to plug or to plug the numbers or understand the numbers. No, the the, I, the whole purpose there was just to see, depending on your own understanding, your own analysis of the arguments and how good they are, the strength of the evidence. How would you do it? And then here's here are different ways of doing this. So um, I think the calculator remains a useful way of sort of calculating the 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 probative force of all these arguments taken together yeah um and the arguments themselves can have varying degrees of strength how many of them do i think are independent i don't know that's a very hard question mm -hmm. and i think there needs to be more work done on this uh exactly how to establish probabilistic independence between arguments uh and you'd need a big probability brain like tim mcgrew <laughs> or that's or, true. Uh, or Rob Collins or or someone like that, uh, or maybe even Ted Poston. I know he's working on a book uh, where he considers this. I don't know in what detail. Oh, awesome. But uh, I mean, this this is a topic that really does need a lot of attention. How do you establish probabilistic independence between arguments? Mm -hmm. uh, and then how many different theistic arguments are we le left with? I don't yeah. know. I know Ted thinks it's some something like maybe three or four. Uh, I think it's probably a lot more than that. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is I don't know. No, that's huge. Um, <clears throat> yeah, some, something that Joe had talked about, Joe Schmidt, again, I'll probably reference him a lot, 
um, he he was talking about the conclusions of the arguments and how like some might might have uh, some might be arguments for classical theistic God, whereas others might be for a neoclassical or or um, in in very various levels of uh, like uh, fine grained definition, right? Where it's like just a mm -hmm. God or a necessary being or something like that. Mm -hmm. how, how much does that play into like the argument from all arguments uh, from from all the arguments? I, we're gonna get into that later too. So if you wanna. If you want to punt on that till later, we could do that as well. No, so it, obviously, if the conclusions of two different arguments are incompatible, then you, one of the arguments has to be thrown out, right? Right, right, right. Uh, so that's how you're going to have to resolve that. If you if you're concluding to, uh, let's just say, a very an un, unambiguously classical picture of God, so let's just say like a a God that's absolutely simple, for example. Yeah, and, and there are theistic arguments to that effect. Right. Uh, then that's going to be incompatible with, well, it's going to be incompatible with an argument that I like that uh, goes to the, from the PSR to the conclusion that God is not simple. But most of these theistic arguments are not going to be that specific. Yeah. Uh, unless we're getting into the territory of what's called ramified natural theology. Now, ramified natural theology is a branch of natural theology that whose arguments conclude not just a general like God exists or something, but like they actually take data and conclude the Christian God exists or, yeah. you know, the Muslim God exists or something. They're actually arguments for the God of a specific religious tradition. And so, uh, yeah, you would have to, uh, and so there, there are uh, Muslim arguments for an absolutely simple God, right. For example. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and if you think uh, the Christian God is a Trinity and the Trinity is incompatible with simplicity, well, you got to deal with those arguments. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, 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 you got to throw out the arguments that are in that are inconsistent with your conclusions, right? Yeah, dude, that's what I think is so cool here because it, it, it moves the conversation further and I don't know where it moves it. It, it, it moves it out and in and strengthens it. It's yeah. another level to this where it's like, Hey, if, if you have an argument from all the arguments, you need to make sure that your arguments aren't, don't have conflicting, uh, conclusions, which yeah, is so cool. True. Yeah. Most of these arguments, though, I think the, they're, they conclude to a being that's general enough to where I, I don't really see much of a conflict in, okay. in all their conclusions. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, this is what most theistic philosophers do is at the end of a cumulative case style argument where they bring in all these different arguments, they sort of abductively stitch together the yeah. conclusions of all these different argu arguments to arrive at a more theologically rich picture of God. Yeah. And then it's it's cool at the end there uh, when they when they are stitching through you you might get into like comparative religions which everyone thinks philosophy everyone outside the academy thinks philosophy right. of religion is right but yeah. I I just love that man I think it's so cool um, and I'm trying to learn some Bayesian stuff so I can join the conversation but <laughs> freaking Bayes man um, <laughs> everywhere yeah so so um, let's get in you, your your work here in these two uh, recent articles is going over uh, traditional arguments for theism and i will i i just have to admit like i insist on making outlines for all my guests i don't let anyone give me an outline except for chad because he's so legit and uh jordan stefaniak has done it once or twice but because you guys are just so good i'm like all right well that looks like something i'd make and i appreciate it so um chad is awesome and he sent me this and we're gonna go over some like classic misconceptions and then some classic uh or some recent developments so it's going to be really fun to go through these arguments you might be familiar with and say, well, not quite. And also, here's why someone else says not quite uh, in the recent literature. So, um, Chad, you, should we start with cosmological arguments? Yeah, that's good. That's a good place to start. But just even before that, yeah, I just thought it was an, a good idea. Ra rather than go through all the arguments again, which yeah. you know I've done elsewhere, and I'm, I'm sure you've had guests on that go into the, these individual arguments in more detail, uh, let's let's go meta. Let's talk about some common misconceptions and and maybe yeah. some recent developments to maybe kind of keep it a little bit more interesting. And yeah. so, so so we might have to sail in between the sort of like introductory sort of material, uh, but also some stuff that would be interesting to people who might not um, who might know a little bit more about the subject. So and, and that's perfect. That's perfect for my audience, because a lot of a lot of the folks listening are going to have some familiarity, but they want to go deep and kind of stay met like It'll be awesome to, to stay at that level. And again, uh, for those listening, I'll just remind you guys, ask the questions you want. So we're going to start with cosmological. If you got cosmological type questions, ask them there. Super Chat helps me see them in the thing. And it's good for my wallet, which is great. Um, 
and I guess you could do it later if you show up later, or whatever, too. But uh, I'll I'll give Chad final veto power on that. So yeah. ask him when you're supposed to, I guess. Yeah. So let's let's dive in on cosmological arguments. Yeah, cosmological arguments. Uh, just as a brief characterization, they seek to demonstrate the existence of a transcendent cause hmm. or explanation of the cosmos, or or some universal constituent of the cosmos, like uh, things that change, or things that are caused, or things that are in motion, or are contingent, or composite. Things that are dependent or grounded or whatever. Uh, so this is a very large family of arguments. Um, and in fact, uh, years ago when I was reading through Frederick Copleston's History of Philosophy, yeah. one thing that really struck me was how ubiquitous cosmological arguments throughout every period of philosophy were. And in yeah. fact, um, it's, it's a pretty much a good rule of thumb was if you wanted to get a good handle on, on someone's metaphysical thought, just look at what they said about the cosmological argument. Ah, wow. Uh, and and, and it, it's there. So so the first misconception, I guess we could just get out of the way very quickly, is that there is no the cosmological argument, right? right, uh, right. And I'm sure you've heard that the cosmological argument is everything that exists has a cause. The universe exists, so the universe has a cause, and it's God. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, you know, uh, this is ridiculous on so many levels, and, I mean, not least because, uh, it, it, you know, it's supposed to invite the question, well, if everything has a cause, then what cause God, right? Right. We right. just got your question. Now, laymen can be forgiven for this misconception, but it is astonishing how many professional philosophers you see repeat this canard, this turd of an argument <laughs> in yeah. their published work, in their lectures and their published work. Uh, I think Ed... Edward Fazer, he even calls this the straw man that will not die. Yeah. I, th I think that's a that's a very apt description. So that, that would be our first misconception about cosmological arguments. This is this turd of an argument. Yeah. Yeah. It's even like it's even like cliche to respond to that now. Right. Like the whole yeah. thing is become because you're like, well, actually, and you're like, well, dude, yeah, we all know the actually part, too. <laughs> right. Dang it. Like it's all it's all right. so cliche and yeah. it sucks. And can we can we just move on from this, please? Yeah. And we can't. We can't because a lot of introductory texts in philosophy keep repeating this. There's even mm -hmm. there's even an, an introductory logic text from the 1880s that complains about this straw man. And so mm -hmm. it's been around for a long time. And and uh, you know I'm a pessimist at heart, so I, <laughs> I think it's going to be one that that we have to deal with forever. Yeah. Well, um, there's been some contemporary developments, and yeah. there's, as you brought up in the paper, uh, in this outline here, there's modal cosmological arguments. So, yeah, yeah help us out with that. Yeah, so I, fl I sort of tagged this as a contemporary development that's somewhat misleading because there are modal cosmological arguments in, in, throughout history. Uh, there's one in Anselm, um, uh, as A.D. Smith argues uh, in his book. Uh, there's, uh, SCOTUS is actually known for sort of a, giving a modal twist to, to okay. cosmological arguments. So, uh, but in general, these arguments, but they're really popular today, um, among philosophers because, uh, the idea is that they sort of make cosmological principles, the main premise in cosmological arguments more modest. Hmm. Uh, so, so yeah, so the, the thought is that they rely on more modest premises or, or okay. seemingly more modest premises. So for example, if you say a typical cosmological argument, the premise is whatever's contingent has a cause. Hmm. A modal version would say whatever is contingent possibly has a cause. Yeah. So you're not even just saying it does have a cause. You're saying it possibly has a cause. Now you can say it's possible that all contingent reality has a cause. You're not saying it does, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. Well, since it's the cause of all contingent reality we're talking about, the cause itself can't be contingent, but necessary. So the possible cause is possibly necessary. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Because usually, because if you soften it, then you soften the conclusion, but we're not doing that here because it's modal. Right, because that's we, right. Yeah. Uh, and so the key move is this modal inference that's so common in theistic arguments, which is that what's possibly necessary is necessary. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and of course, whatever is necessary is actual. So it follows from it's possibly being the case that there's a cause of all contingent reality, that there is a necessarily existing cause of all contingent reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, I like that. I like messing with 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 modal stuff. So so uh, I guess the the challenge uh, a good place to challenge would 
be to say, well, I'm going to challenge that view that if something is uh, the the move from possibility to necessary, necessary right there, like something is possible, then it is necessarily possible. What What's that move called? Well, you can license that inference in several different modal systems. Okay. But the most popular one is is S five modal system S five. I didn't but, know if that was a if that was an S five thing or if like Lewis is. I think Lewis. It's, it's also valid. It's also valid in system B. Okay. Uh, but the most popular one is uh, S five. Okay. Yeah. Nice. That's sweet. You know, what's possibly necessary is necessary. That's also valid in in modal system B, which is pretty weak, but also S five. Yeah. Dang man, that's sweet. Well, um. I mean, what do you, what do you make of that? You think that's a is that a good argument? These modal cosmological arguments? Yeah, yeah. I guess it's well, a family, right? Everything's a family yeah. of arguments. Yeah. So we'd have to take them argument argument by argument. But uh, one one thing that would you would cons- you would worry about is whether or not they really are more modest. Because mm. if the inference really does get you from you know. Uh, it, if we're talking about a necessarily existent being, this is a complaint about the ontological argument as well. Uh, and you just, and you just tack on a possibility operator on the front. Uh, you're not, it's not really something more modest. And this yeah. is, this was something that was shown to be a problem with uh, Alexander Proust and Richard Gale's cosmological argument. It was one of the first modal cosmological arguments. And they framed it in terms of this weak principle of sufficient reason yeah. That said that, well, it's not that everything has an explanation. It's that everything possibly has an explanation. Right. Well, one of the one of the critiques in the literature that came about from that was that, well, this weak principle of sufficient reason actually entails the stronger principle of sufficient reason. So it's actually not as modest. Just as adding that. a step or something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not as modest as they originally thought it was. So that would okay. be... It, it, but this we're speaking in generalities. You got to critique uh, specific. Right. You, you know, you got to take the arguments case by case and, and offer critiques yeah. of the arguments case by case. Yeah. And that's so, man. I love that this the the modern work, the recent work, to moving the conversation forward because then there's some work to be done to say this is more modest or this is not more modest. And now we the the, the conversation is is moving downstream, yeah. and it's just there's more work to be done. It's fun. It's it's yeah. awesome, dude. Because yeah. all all hyped up. Um, <laughs> what do you? I guess for for those, um, I'd like to do a little bit of introduction type stuff too. What do you what do you think of Craig's trifold uh, classification? I saw you mentioned that in the paper, between like the Thomistic t- Kalam and and Leibnizian. Um, mm-hmm. Do you do you like that? Do you think that's a good characterization? Uh, it it's very coarse grained. Okay, it's very coarse grained. So, I think it's good to the way he he lays it all out. So the the Thomistic reject infinite regresses. The Kalam uh, regresses in, in order of rank or ontology. Kalam mm-hmm. rejects regresses in order of time. And then Leibnizian cosmological arguments just rely on a principle of fish reason, have no reference to regresses at all. Yeah. Um, but I think there are just so many cosmological arguments that yeah. break this sort of neat trifold. Okay. Not to mention, you know, the sort of modal cosmological arguments we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can bring in uh, objections to infinite regresses uh, in a lot of these arguments. Uh, oh, not, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so they don't just have to be Kalam or Thomistic. Um, so, I mean, for, just for example, you can reject infinite regress arguments in defense of a Leibnizian argument just by saying you can't have an infinite regress of explanations all the way down. Yeah, because uh, PSR, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it wouldn't so, be like technically it wouldn't fit that no reference to regress type stuff. Yeah. I know uh Michael Almeida, he his way of classifying cosmological arguments, which is a more fine-grained way, is just to say that uh you just classify it based on what is trying to be explained. So okay. you have a cosmological argument that's trying to explain motion or contingent objects or yeah. dependent objects. And and so you have as many. The problem with that one is it's almost too fine grained because then you have as many cosmological arguments as you do phenomena in mm-hmm. the arguments. Right. 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 Um, so I, I think maybe a good way of doing it is sticking with Craig's trifold classification, adding modal cosmological arguments. Mm. And I'm really tempted to just call this scotistic. Because Scotus's argument uh, traditionally is like, uh, you know, probably one of the first modal 
cosmological arguments if you don't count count Anselm's. Okay. Uh, and then maybe adding just a miscellaneous category. <laughs> so, yeah, that's nice. It's going like Thomistic, Thomistic, Kalam, Leibnizian, uh, modal, miscellaneous. I don't yeah. know. It's it's a it, the it's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's good. Um, well, I'm glad, and I've been resisting saying uh, that we're going to chart the logical space because uh, because of some of the stuff that you've helped me with in writing, <laughs> and not to use cliches too often. So we're not yeah, going to yeah. we're not going to do that, even though that's yeah. we might be doing that. <laughs> um, well, all right, man. So anything else on on cosmological before we jump to ontological? Oh, I'm ready. Awesome. All right. So um, ontological argument. Um, you, you have here the, the classical misconception is that ontological arguments, uh, they assume that existence is a predicate. So so why is that a, a bad assumption? Yeah, the idea is that we can't just say God must exist because he's the greatest possible being. And it's greater to exist than not exist because existence itself is not a predicate or a property things have on top of all their other properties. It's things exist first, so to speak, and then have properties. Existence is not itself among the properties that things have. Mm -hmm. uh, so the ontological argument fails. Now, um, a few things about this. The first is that, well, some people actually do think existence is a property or a predicate. Yeah. Uh, weirdly, this sort of like existence is not a predicate slogan has reached unquestionable dogma status in philosophy more than any other principle in philosophy uh at least when we're talking about the ontological argument uh yeah. so it, it, yeah so just leave aside for the second that you know this might actually be a debatable question um it's now widely recognized that there are multiple different versions of the the ontological argument argument in anselm's writings and some don't even depend on this assumption that existence is a predicate hmm. uh, what philosophers have come to appreciate is that all we need to assume is that necessary existence is a predicate. Uh, that is ne necessity or necessary existence is a property. Necessary. Necessity is a property. Um, and, and obviously it is. Uh, so, so now we can just say that, well, if God exists as a perfect being, he would have the property of necessity. God would be a necessary being. But what's possibly necessary is necessary. There's that modal inference again. So the success of the ontological argument all hangs on whether it's possible that God exists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we don't even need this uh, original uh, proslogion two version of Amsom's argument uh, to talk about what, you know, the ontological argument. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you, uh, so like classically, and, and, you know, sometimes I get sick of this one too, like mm -hmm. Ganilo and, and, uh, <laughs> Anselm, right? So, like, can you add the, can you just, up, so we've updated necessary existence instead of just existence. That's the, that's the property. Yeah. Can you, can you update the perfect island argument? Has that been done to say, like, well, can you just slap on necessary existence to uh, a necessarily existent island? Well, that seems to start playing havoc, it seems to me, with the concept of an island. You know, we have... <laughs> <laughs> we, we have grains of sand we have palm trees we have uh beachy shores we have coconuts all these things are not necessarily existent mm -hmm. they they come into existence and pass out of existence so islands themselves uh are not going to be candidates for necessary beings yeah yeah okay um yeah that's good it just would like yeah it would wreak havoc on our whole view of the world right like because it's like yeah. well Every other island is is uh, contingent, but this one's necessary. Yeah, yeah. So, in order to establish good parody arguments like this, you have to find a kind of being that is such that if it exists at all, it ex it plausibly exists necessarily. Yeah. And all these other parodies, the pizza, the flying spaghetti monster, the islands, yeah. they don't have that property. Now, what does have that property uh, are abstract objects. Yeah. So if uh, so, you could have a parody argument there, and I think there's a real problem there. Uh, you could run a, an exactly parallel ontological argument for the existence of abstract objects, mm -hmm. uh, and so how you square that with God's existence, then and aseity and all that stuff uh, turns into its own. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Jay, can I ask you about that? Like, do you have a preferred way of solving that? Uh, I I I kind of plop for a sort of divine conceptualism. Yeah, my I man, just think, that's good. Yeah, I I think that. Uh, it's no coincidence that we have these parallel arguments for abstract objects because those ultimately depend on unnecessary being. 
uh, namely God. So uh, they are themselves reflections of a divine being. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, this is a whole different thing and we can totally, mm -hmm. let's, let's stop it like a little short, but um, do you go in for like theistic activism? You think God uh, like invented uh, circles or are they just uh, necessarily like part of his, his thinking or they yeah. are just there? I would say that there's some sort of necessary product of his thing, not, not even product. Uh, they're just sort of like necessary structural cognitive equipment that God. Yeah, has. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, that that seems pretty close to Welty's thought. That's good, man. I like that. Yeah. I can get down with that. Yeah. Um, all right, so we have uh, we have got a super chat here, and uh, it's from Kingdom Kid. Thank you for the super chat to the philosophizing grappler, and it could be grapplers because Chad was also a wrestler as well. I was. I love that, dude. So that's right. That's why we connect so well, because you, you, and you're you're super hardcore, dude. I love that about you. We're wrestlers. We got snapping turtles. You know. Oh, got... Yes, dude. We both have alligator snapping turtles. I love that. That's right. That's so good. So, so we we talked about the class. This is a classic misconception that has been updated. Um, I guess if you're still going for, like for Anselm, then I guess you can still raise it against an Anselmian uh, critic, but. There's some pretty good ones out there too, uh, but there's this contemporary misconception too uh, that modal ontological arguments require uh, S5, and so maybe yeah. going for S4 or different, you know, so then we can evade uh, the argument here. So, wh wh what do you make of that contemporary misconception? So, it's it's completely misconceived. Uh, hmm. it, I mean, in in its most generic form, the modal ontological argument boils down to this premise one. Either it's necessary that God exists, or it's not possible that God exists. Premise hmm. two, it's possible that God exists. Uh, and it follows from those two premises, God exists. Uh, and the main premise there is that it's possible that God exists. That's what we're interested in trying to defend. Uh, that's where basically all the cutting edge stuff on the ontological argument is right now, is trying to defend the possibility of God's existence, uh, why we should think that that's more reasonable to reasonable to believe than its complement. Uh, it's not possible that God exists. Okay, so you take that generic modal ontological argument. Do we need S5, the modal system S5, uh, for this argument to be valid? No, this is demonstrably hmm. false. Uh, this generic argument uh, is valid in all non-trivial modal systems from the very weakest, which is called T, and then on up to, to systems B, S4, and S5. So um, I've given you links to where we can we can de demonstrate the proofs, where we can actually yeah. de uh, uh, generate the proofs in real time, uh, demonstrating the, the validity of this argument in all modal systems T and above. All right. Can we see that? Is it showing up? There we go. Yeah. So that was that. Uh, yep. Uh, it's T. So Do the, I need to run it back or something? Uh, yeah, there you go. Look at that. It's kind of quick. Can I slow? I don't know if I can slow it down, but look at that. All you nerds out there can read it. So Super the fast. what you see in the bar up there is just the premises of the argument, and then the blue check mark there is the relation of reflexivity, which is the the essential relation to modal system T. So we're in modal system T. There's your premises. Is the conclusion G God's existence? Is that valid? From those premises, you run the argument. Yes, it is. Hmm. Um, and now go up to uh, modal system B. All right, one second here. And then, so in addition to reflexivity, modal system B adds symmetry. And these are these are what are called symmet. Uh, I'm sorry, accessibility relations in modal logic. Modal logic is all about what worlds are accept accessible to other worlds, depending on these different formal properties. Um, so we have reflexivity and symmetry clicked. Whoa, look at that. It's valid in <laughs> system B as well. Uh, okay. Now, if we want to go up to modal system S4, then uh, we have uh, reflexivity and transitivity. It can't, can't be in S4, man. It can't be there, too. I don't believe it. I believe well, when the, I see it. The proof in S4, I think, is the, actually the same as in B because the relevant accessibility relation is just going to be reflexivity okay. um so there you go uh, i think i have it on oh yeah okay symmetric gotcha uh, well well s4 is reflexive and transitive not symmetric and transitive um but it Can does to click this? Scale, symmetric and, and transitive what would be symmetric and transitive i don't know 
Well, it's, it's valid in that system too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Now we got uh, S5, which S5, is S5, like... and then and then you just click. Uh, he's got a nice um, option there to click universal. Um, so it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. The accessibility relations in S5. Um, and there you go. That's the simplest deduction hmm. uh, in S5 because S5 gives you most accessibility relations. Well, I mean, the whole debate is because a lot of philosophers think that S5 intuitively captures our intuitions about the metaphysics of modality. Hmm. Ooh. That's what most philosophers just sort of unreflectively use when they do modality, when they do modal metaphysics. And so, oh, well, it turns out the modal ontological argument is valid in S5. Now we have this controversy about, oh, is S5 all that good? Uh, let's let's go. Let's backtrack. Maybe uh, maybe it's uh, not that good anyway. So but these debates about S5 and the ontological argument are completely irrelevant uh, hmm. because the, the main modal inferences are valid in much weaker systems. So uh, I say That's crazy. This one, this is this is like totally brand new to me because I always hear that the contemporary misconception that it's just s5 and so we go in for something else and i dude that's this is like my one part of my summer project is bays and modal logic so i'm like all right well let me get back to you on that but uh <laughs> but so what's what's that website that we had pulled up where, where can someone uh look look into what you what we just ran for them yeah this is a really cool website it's just umsu.de backslash trees backslash and this is a proof generator uh it does uh a propositional predicate and modal logic. So you, as long as you know the operators and and the inference rules, you can check your proofs. I wish Sounds I had this in, in undergrad and graduate school when I was when I did all my logic courses. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, th this is a, just an amazing website. That's awesome. So, man, that's so crazy. So, I mean, what do you what do you make of the argument? We don't we we weren't planning on doing like a full like tier list or anything like that, but it. It seems pretty good. I I guess Swinburne wouldn't like it because he doesn't think God's a necessary being. Uh, yeah. Well, I think it it all comes down to this possibility premise, right? Is it possible that God exists? Mm. And does it does do arguments for the possibility of God's existence? Do they just beg the question? Are those just arguments for God's existence? This is the way like uh, Cameron Bertuzzi just framed it on over on his page. Yeah. Uh, and and I think no, it's not like that. Because it's not like um, necessary existence is part of the concept of God in the same way that bachelorhood is part of the concept of being an unmarried male. These are different ways of uh, the, the conceptual connections in both cases are different. We need a reason to think that God, if God exists, is a necessary being in a way that we don't need a reason to think that. Uh, a mar an unmarried man is a bachelor. That's just yeah. part of the concept. No, yeah. we need to actually argue for that premise that if God exists, God is a necessary being. So you got to appeal to like perfect being theology considerations or something like that. But that's that's precisely what doesn't make this argument beg the question, contrary to what uh, a lot of people seem to think. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It brings up uh, another another comment from Digital Gnosis, who's just tearing it up in the comment section, uh, which I appreciate. Someone should go do a parallel ontological argument for Oppie's necessary initial physical state theory then which nothing greater can be conceived um which just kind of brings out that that point you're just making where i can leave that up to um yeah just necessary being isn't synonymous with god right it's not in the same way that unmarried no. man and bachelor uh, no like that it's just not. Is the, the analytic truth that's correct uh and so that 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 yeah that's absolutely correct because necessary beings of themselves per se um uh, even though I would want to argue in a different way, I would want to argue from abstract objects to to God. Um, you can have necessary beings that that are not God, um, numbers, yeah. sets, properties, propositions, and and so on. Right, right. So um, here's a question: um, <clears throat> Would it work through intuitionist intuitionist logic? You know, I don't I don't know the formalities of intuitionistic logic enough mm -hmm. to be able to say. Uh, my understanding, I think I encountered this briefly in grad school when I did my philosophy of logic seminar. I'm trying to reach really far back here. Not intuition. I always skip logic. this part. Yeah. Yeah. It's that intuitionistic logic is not very widely received today. Mm -hmm. It's my, my impression. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so I don't know either. Um, yeah, sorry. Just don't know. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's good enough. Um, awesome. So there's well, a, there's a, let me just say this. Yeah. Please. Uh, uh, intuition, intuitionistic logic is not some sort of alternative to to modal logic. That's what I was thinking. It's not like a different system, right? That it's yeah. It's, it's not like it's, just... it's rejecting modal logic. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah apart from yeah, so move on. Same, same with yeah, same with like if you brought up like paraconsistent or something like that. It's like well, that has to do with like whether contradictions can exist, but it doesn't. Mm, mm. So I mm -hmm. I don't know. It might come in further down the line, um, if you want to. Yeah, because in order to deny uh, this, in order to deny modal ontological arguments, you'd need to say that um, it's metaphysically impossible that God exists or that you find a contradiction in a couple of his attributes. So this kind of God doesn't exist, right? Well, you'd either find a contradiction or you would find the concept of God so myopic, mm. so unclear that you, you wouldn't be, even be able to say it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that that myopia would just like sort of undermine your concept of of God being possible. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what do you make of the distinction between like uh, like uh, epistemology and metaphysics here where someone's like, hey, is it possible that God exists? And you're like, yeah, I guess it's possible. And you go, oh, surprise, yeah. gotcha, sucker. Like God. And you're like, well, no, I was saying like epistemically, like, I guess. But I didn't want to maintain like metaphysically because I think that's what, what do you make of that that? move or that well there's certainly there's certainly a difference between epistemic possibility and metaphysical possibility mm -hmm. and those lines do get blurred in defenses of the possibility of god's existence like uh you know well it seems possible to me that god exists yeah uh well you know epistemic possibility doesn't really have much utility apart from like probability judgments yeah um, now, when you bring it over to like modal or I mean, metaphysical judgments, all we have are just epistemic seemings and, con you know, conceivings and imagining right. and things like that. These are just these are essentially epistemic notions. And the question is whether or not those are sufficient to latch onto metaphysical realities. Yeah. And so you could. And so there's a bunch of arguments you can run here about whether or not conceivability entails possibility and all that stuff. But yeah, uh, yeah. that I need to dive in deeper on this kind of stuff because, um, yeah, it does seem like they they might collapse in on each other. When, when you when you talk about metaphysical possibility, um, this is something that came up with Malpass and Anderson, which like, man, uh, could I be born to different parents? Like that's something that people say generally. Like, no, that's a metaphysical uh, impossibility that you would be born to different parents. And it's like, well, how, why do I think that? Well, because it doesn't seem conceivable that I would be me without my parents. And it's like, well, now we're like, is are we uh, blurring lines between epistemology and, and? Well, it also, you know, gets into uh, essentialism and modality, uh -huh. uh, and Kripke's argument from the essentiality of origins. What's yeah. what are my essential properties, and uh -huh. are my parents' genetic material essential to me, and so forth? Yeah. Right. So this, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we don't have to. I'm I'm tempted, but I won't I won't do it. <clears throat> um, well, let's. Uh, anything else on ontological? This is this is awesome stuff. I I'm I'm excited about all the the new stuff going on in ontological arguments because usually people are like, that's so dumb. And like, well, yeah, surprise, so well, well, deal with it. Like, what are you what are you gonna say? <laughs> so, yeah, as I say, it all boils down to this this premise: uh, is is God's existence possible? And I, I, and probably the most cutting edge thing here is is Eugene Nagasawa's book, uh, Maximal God. Yeah, where he defends what he calls the Maximal God thesis, which is is that we can just avoid this whole debate about God's possible existence by just simply defining God as the being with the maximal degree of knowledge, power, and goodness that's mutually consistent. Yeah, uh, and if that's possible, I mean, if, now it's possible by nef definition, right? So whatever conception of those attributes meets that extremity of possibility their instantiation is now just possible by definition. Uh, and so there's no need to provide an additional argument for the possibility premise uh, because it's possible, possible by definition. Um, so is that cheating? Do you think that is, is that cheating? I think that the main problem here is going to be demonstrating that this threshold of possibility is going to be high enough to be God's status. Mm. Uh, or could it just be sort of like a very like a Zeus like status or could it be uh, something even less impressive than that? 
yeah. maybe maybe it turns out that uh, you know the to to get all three of the, the, the maximal degree of knowledge, power, and goodness, like the maximum to get all three, the highest threshold we should we could possibly have. Well, it turns out that that's only uh, you know like my great grandpa. He was like a really good guy. He's pretty strong. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so what uh, so what reason do we have to think that that threshold is going to be God uh, mm. and not just a, a mundane being or a Zeus like being? So that's that's going to be the problem. And I asked Eugene about this and he said, well, it's 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 on the atheist to, to prove that it's not going to be a God like being. I'm not really convinced by that response, but yeah, it is what it is. OK, so there's some more work to be done there, too, as yeah, well, which definitely. would be fun. Uh, what, what do you make of like the reverse reverse modal ontological arguments? Do you think that's are those are those fair game or is that like. What, what, what do you make of this? Do we need well, a yeah, symmetry breaker? Certainly fair game, but it, again, it goes to what reason we have to think God's existence is possible or what reason we have to, to be justified in believing that over its opposite. Yeah. Um, and I think, and I've got a paper out defending this, that judgments of possibility, and this goes back to uh, a lot of what's in Leibniz as well, judgments of possibility deserve a, deserve a presumption of of innocence of credulity that uh, that judgments of impossibility do not. Hmm. So when you say something's possible, you can you know you kind of reflect about it. And it's like, am I running into any like internal inconsistencies or contradictions? No. Does it seem so unclear to me that I can't even assess whether it's possible? No. Yeah, it just seems possible. Now, when you say something is impossible, what you're saying is there's some sort of debilitating capacity. That prevents me from even seeing it being possible, or or what you're saying is that you see a contradiction uh, that's preventing the possibility here. So when you say something's impossible, that seems to have like a higher burden of proof. This is uh, a stronger claim. Stronger claim. Yeah, yeah. So so if you say something, well, that seems impossible. Immediately, I want to say, why? Tell me what what are you running into? Right? What's the problem here? What's the barrier? Uh, and and then we can talk about that. So it yeah. seems to be a stronger claim. And so if there is this presumption in favor of possibility, then I think we have a presumption in favor of God's existence. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so that could be, yeah, that could be a, a symmetry breaker there. I always think of like the, the I probably got this from C.S. Lewis, something like a spider in the garden. And you're like, is it, is there a spider in the garden? And uh, to say no is like a pretty strong claim. You're saying like, I know, I've looked under every leaf, there's no spider. But to say like, maybe, is like way way easier, way weaker. Like yeah, yeah there, there there could be. Yeah, I don't know. And I think it, it's similar over here where it's like, but yeah, possibly. So, but to be like, it's impossible that there's a spider in the garden. Like, okay, you have to tell me why. That's a brilliant brilliant connection, Parker. Because this gets to I'm sure you know like Steve Weichstra's cornea principle. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Which is what I try to apply to modal claims. So, hmm. um, in in defense of the of the ontological argument. So brilliant oh, awesome. connection. Yeah, Weichstra's a man. I'm still trying yeah. to get him on. No one else get him. Uh, on. He's mine. He's mine. Um, all right. I'll, well, so uh, I'll prod him to to come on for you. Do that. He's such a great guy. I love that guy. Yeah, um, <clears throat> let's go. Uh, let's go design. Anything else on ontological, or you want to jump in on design? Let's go design. Awesome. Um, okay. Classic misconception. Paley's argument is analogical and refuted by Hume. Yeah. So typically, Paley's argument is presented as analogical. Something like uh, some things in nature resemble a watch. Yeah. Watches are designed. So by analogy or by parallel reasoning, some things in nature are designed too. But a more faithful reading of Paley shows that he didn't argue this way. Uh, he, he draws attention to those properties of a watch, which imply design, mm -hmm. then argues that those exact same properties are also found in things in nature. So the argument structure seems to be deductive. If something has properties X, Y, and Z, it's designed. Some things in nature do have those properties, X, Y, Z. So some things in nature are designed. So what are the properties? Uh, well, pa Paley said that it's something like multiple parts working together to achieve a common goal or function. And then he illustrates that principle by appeal to the watch. Hmm. But his it's an illustration, not, not an analogy. Yes, it's an illustration <laughs> of the principle, of the philosophical principle at play here. But his point is not that some things in nature merely resemble design things or are design like his point is that some things in nature are designed because yeah. they have the exact same properties of design things. Uh, and he appeals to the watch to illustrate those properties. Um, so the question is why is Paley's argument so commonly interpreted in this analogical way? Well, I think 
I think the reason is pedagogical. It's purely a ped- pedagogical reason. Yeah. Lazy professors <laughs> pigeonhole Paley's argument as the easy target of Hume's critique of the analogical design argument in the dialogues. Mm. Uh, and so it's just such an easy pairing of course readings. You have Paley, and then right after Paley comes Hume to demolish yeah. the design argument, right? It's just, it's, it's been anthologized so many times that it almost seems impossible to break. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, this is yet another misconception about, about the, the actual dialectic as it played out in history. Paley was aware of Hume's critique of the design arguments. That's what I've heard, yeah. And he deliberately structured his argument to avoid Hume's criticisms. Hmm. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that Paley's argument's any good. That just means that it's not the bad argument critique by Hume. Yeah. Uh, so can we just get over again? It's just like, get over this, please. Yeah. Um, I, the dialogues, I like the dialogues, uh, Hume's dialogues, and I, I kind of have to because everyone says how good they are. And at first I was like, yeah, no, man, he writes weird. <laughs> it's like old English. But then I ended up liking it. Um, and I, I might still be saying that. I, I have to read it again. I might still be saying that just to because everyone else does. I don't like that. But, um, the stone right so you go well look like there's a there's a stone on the beach as well you find a watch you find a stone and presumably on the theistic worldview the stone is just as created as the watch secondary means i guess through yeah. an image bearer right but the stone's supposed to be created too but it doesn't have any of the uh mechanisms or anything like that so wh- wh- what do we make of that so how we infer something is designed or specially designed yeah, and and you put your finger on the on the main point here is whether or not something is the product of like intermediary causes or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now the the what criteria we use to infer something is designed or or deduce that something is designed. Now this this is just plagued design arguments since Paley and, and, and in fact before before Paley. Yeah. And there's really not a lot out there on that that's new there's of course Dembski's. well paley thought it was like multiple parts working together to achieve a common goal or function uh be he thinks it's something like that but he adds the the irreducibly complex elements yeah yeah uh Dembski has his probabilistic you know elimination style argument uh del ratch my former professor at calvin he oh, thought i didn't it, know you had him that's awesome man yeah uh, he he thought it's uh, the 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 key is counterflow is when something has properties that run counter to the normal c- course of nature. So there's a lot of different uh, possibilities here, but uh, and, and this is something that I kind of stumbled into believing as I worked on this topic was, you know, maybe maybe all this is kind of uh, pie in the sky in a, in a way. Yeah, uh, maybe our it, maybe we don't even infer design at all. I think we just more often we just straight up intuit something is designed, or we, yeah. or to use Del Rech's term, we perceive things that are designed, uh, and that could be something uh, as you know uh, that could that could apply to the object on the beach, you know, the stone on the beach, uh, as well as a watch. Uh, it doesn't matter. You have this raw intuition that seems to be so deep seated. Mm. And our in our in our mechanisms to, to infer things that are or, or just perceive or believe things are designed just by looking at them that we don't even we're not even latching on to certain properties they have. We're just straight up thinking that's designed. Hmm. That's designed. that's the product of intelligence. That's the product of uh, creativity. Yeah. Uh, and I don't see any problem with that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Digital Gnosis again here. Well, let me let me do some others real quick. So. Uh... Slam RN, she's awesome. Uh, she says, great stuff to listen to while uh, doing sterile dressing changes, which is uh, fun to think about. Between uh, wounds right now, that's awesome. Uh, Random Theology says, Chad's a beast. Happy anniversary again, Chad. Sorry if that's doxing uh, your anniversary there, but that's... Uh, oh, that's good thank thing. you so much. I'm honored. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, okay, so uh, DG again says, uh, he's fleshing out, making my, my what I was bringing up a little bit more co- coherent here. Uh, I think the objection here is more that the theist has no reason for appealing to trees, et cetera, over a rock if on their hypothesis everything is designed. So uh, we're, we're saying, I'm, I'm perceiving, well, maybe maybe let me let me add to it. So like I'm perceiving that this rock is designed because I know more about ge- geology or something like that and I can see like the complexity that would have to, the type of universe that would have to exist even to produce this rock. But then maybe you come along and you're like, no, I'm not, I'm not seeing that. And so now we need an argument 
because we have con conflicting perceptions or, or, or intuitions or what, what do you think about that? Yeah, it could it could be something like our own dispositions on how we interpret nature or mm -hmm. uh, the, the, our own like theoretical baggage that we're bringing to interpreting objects in nature. Uh, it could be a lot of things going on there, but I agree. I agree. I mean, sometimes you can go out and just pluck a blade of grass and some people will be hit by this strong design intuition. Like, oh my God, this is design. And some people will be like, no, it's not. It's just an object of nature. Yeah. Um, and so I think th this is an interesting direction that it would, it would, it would be interesting to see design arguments go in this direction because this, this probably explains why the appeal of design arguments has not abated even in the face of very strong debunking style arguments for like from natural selection, evolution, and so forth. Uh, I mean, despite those sort of debunking arguments, almost no one really uh, sheds the, the intuition that things are designed. Even Dawkins opens his book, The Blind Watchmaker, by defining biology as the study of things that look designed. Yeah. So, uh, and so that's the key part, though. It's just like, well, it just looks designed, and uh, I'm justified in believing it is until I get a strong debunking argument. And these these debunking arguments aren't that strong. Yeah. Or, I mean, the other the the alternative is uh, it's not strong enough to undermine the intuition that God used natural processes to bring about these objects, right. which leaves into into which leaves intact the design inference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know there's been some, uh, I think Tyler McNabb has worked on, yeah, I know he has, uh, like uh, cognitive science type arguments where it's like, well, there might be a mechanism in your brain. And he goes, well, yeah, that's just, you know, that's right. following uh, Uncle Al. You know, that's planning right. as uh, uh, his view of census divinitatis. And then all the reform boys go, hey, planning is wrong on that. But uh, yeah, yeah. So there's there's more to be said about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so getting at the conflicting interpretations is what, some of the best folks in the presuppositional camp are trying to do. And when it hits like the popular level, it gets more like I presuppose this and you presuppose that. And, but it, the, the, the role of presuppositions in interpreting our, mm -hmm. our experiences of the world, the intelligibility, like that's really what it's supposed to be getting at. Um, so I think that's cool that it's like, there's work to be done there. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I won't yeah, say more about a lot theory ladenness of interpretation and things like that. that yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. You know, going to like Thomas Kuhn's work and and we'll, we'll circle back to this at the very end. Awesome. Okay. Um. So we we went classical misconception here. How about uh, contemporary development? Where are we at? Well, cool contemporary development. You know, uh, uh, I won't insult the, your audience's intelligence by presuming they don't, they're not aware of the fine tuning argument. Yeah. Well, uh, Rob Collins, he sort of has a more recent twist on the fine tuning argument. You know, the, the main idea of the fine tuning argument is just that there's this tiny range of of values of the fun that the fundamental constants quantities of the universe could be in order to permit life like us. Uh, if we call that the anthropic range of those values. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an even tinier range of values that the physical constants could assume that make the universe optimal for scientific discovery and investigation hmm. by beings like us. And he calls that the sort of discoverability optimality range. Uh, for example, the universe has a relatively low entropy throughout. Yeah. Uh, but beings like us, we only need a regional pocket of low entropy, not, not, a, not a universe that's low entropy all throughout. Uh, yet the general low entropy all throughout makes the universe is what's responsible for making the universe optimal for observational discoveries in astrophysics and cosmology, yeah. uh, which, is, which is precisely what you would expect if the universe were designed to be favorable for beings like us to make such mm. observations and, and discoveries. Uh, so the fact that the values of certain constants actually do fall within, not just within the anthropic range, but the discoverability optimality range is uh, less probable by many orders of magnitude on theism than on naturalism. Yeah. Uh, now, the wrinkle I want to add is that even though we kind of laugh at it, or at least, you know, you know, us philosophers, you know, Christian philosophers, sometimes we, you know, we look down mm -hmm. on like you know, the popular apologists and all that stuff. And there's this popular uh, book out there called uh, The Privileged Planet, and it has yeah. a film and all that stuff. I think it's within this context, within this probabilistic context that Rob Collins has just set forth 
that those sorts of uh, arguments really start to gain traction. Um, the the privileged planet type arguments start to gain traction. And if you want to look at even more on this, look at look at Michael Denton's book, Nature's Destiny, where he goes through all of these astronomical and biochemical strokes of fortune that ha that that conspire to make Earth not just a possible habitat for carbon-based life, but an amazingly ideal one. Hmm. Uh, so it, it's not that these these don't have the, these instances don't have individual explanations, naturalistic explanations. It's that they all sort are sort of coming together to conspire uh, to make life uh, on Earth not just possible but ideal. Uh, it, the universe not just intelligible but beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and so that I think we're we're coming up to uh, we're we're finding a context in which these sort of more of like a popular way of articulating the design army can be very powerful man that's awesome yeah so sometimes people will will pull out like an anthropic principle saying um yeah everything looks designed or it's it's this world is fit for us but it has to be in order for us to even be able to right. to okay cool but but i think what you're getting at is like but why not just a small pocket then why how come the whole universe is is uh has low entropy such, such that we can observe mm -hmm. it why not just this little pocket and then we can't see anything beyond that okay we need a little pocket for us to exist anthropic principle but now we have we can actually look and discover and there's beauty and you get into other right. stuff like that. Does, that, does that sound right that's right and and sort of the strength of of michael denton's work is that he goes through uh from uh the conditions that need to be right in order for carbon based life to be possible, but then the environment, not just, it's not just consumable or I mean, sorry, um, uh, suitable for carbon based life. Uh, it's ideal for the evolution of carbon based life uh, and not just uh, any carbon based life, but carbon based life that would actually find their environment intelligible mm. um, and not just uh, an intelligible environment, but an environment that's manipulable and amenable to technological innovation. And not mm. just that, but the sort of technological innovation that would uh, branch out, branch out to be conducive to the species, the, f the flourishing of the human species, when all we really need to survive as a species is much less than it seems what we have. It's like we have this humongous, uh, uh, what do you call it? This this treasure chest of of gems and and coins and and uh, like I said earlier, it's just an embarrassment of riches, I guess. Uh, when all we all we really needed to survive was a little sixpence, but we actually w were millionaires, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. You could even we could go from like podcasting, like the the fact that you and I are using this equipment right now to talk mm. to each other. Mm -hmm. That's like the end goal, and, and you see, like, all right, we'll go all the way back. What's possible if we're able to remote podcast right now? That's but right. Uh, that might be an addition. Yeah, <laughs> I love it, man. That's awesome. Um, what's Moral, moral arguments. Yeah, let's go to moral. Awesome. Okay, classic misconception: belief in God is necessary to be moral. Yeah, this is you know you've this is this is the standard. I'm sure you've heard this a million times. This is not what theistic arguments for morality are are seeking to demonstrate. Um, even if it's true, even if it's true that on average people who believe in God uh, generally lead morally better lives who, than those who don't, that's an empirical question, um, uh, and maybe. And if it turns out that it's true that people believe in God uh, live morally better lives, hey, maybe that maybe that's something that we could think about. What's the explanation there? But moral arguments seek to demonstrate the need for either a metaphysical basis for objective morality hmm. or an epistemological basis for the rationality of behaving morally. Uh, and, and so the arguments want to tie those two things together by saying that the basis has to be something godlike. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, like, you know, the classic example of uh, the metaphysical basis will be Craig's argument. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties don't exist, but they do. So God exists. Mm -hmm. um, but a less but lesser known moral arguments are of the latter sort where God where godlike being is necessary for us to satisfy the practical and rational demands of morality. And and these aren't really discussed a lot in the popular literature, but I think they're very fascinating. I think I think these this is a very fascinating family of moral arguments. Yeah, I saw you. Uh, you referenced George Mavrodes, uh religion and the queerness of morality, mm -hmm. and I love 
I love him. He's awesome. I don't know if it's yeah. Mavro Day, but or if he pronounced it or whatever. But he was um, just that, Brody, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that that's a that's another one of those where it's like, it's not straight up deductive. It's not as it's not as sexy. It doesn't get referenced as much. But it's one of those just really good ones. And like, how weird would morality be, uh, yeah. on a non theistic worldview? Yeah, that's it's such a cool paper. I'm glad you mentioned it. And uh, uh, it, it's called Religion and the Queerness of Morality. And I actually wrote a paper on that paper in grad school and i called it and i and i was i was kind of going through the literature and finding all these bad interpretations of Merodius' argument and i came up with what i thought was the true interpretation of argument of his argument and i titled the paper coming out with queerness <laughs> <laughs> of course you did yeah of course i did <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome man i love that um okay so um yeah there are you familiar with like um uh, uh, Sharon Street's uh, evolutionary mm, dilemma. Evolutionary yeah, dilemma. For, yeah. Um, One of I the see... worst papers I ever read. Oh <laughs> man, dude. Okay. Do you, did like you didn't follow or or what do you think? I read that. No, I read that as undergrad, and I looked over at my friend who I was uh, bunking with, and I was like, "How was this even published? Hmm. It was that bad." Wow. Um, dude. And it turns out there's an interesting backstory about that paper. Um, maybe I shouldn't go into that, but yeah, yeah, maybe we save that for off if it's gonna, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's gonna uh, my thing nuked. But there's a, yeah, I know where you're going. There's debunking for uh, the sort of de uh, debunking style arguments for belief in morality, rational um, belief in morality, ba yeah, based on like, like it's kind of like a Plantingian uh, argument, like a uh, evolutionary yeah. argument against naturalism, but for moral arguments, yeah, yeah, and that's Mark Livenvell's uh. A take on the moral argument that's that's the line that he pursues absolutely. okay okay mm -hmm. in the blackwell companion i think that's the main thrust of his argument he basically just applies the evolutionary argument against naturalism but for for morality but for for us being justified in having moral beliefs yeah because it like given uh given not directed evolution darwinistic evolution it's really it'd be really surprising if our moral beliefs somehow aligned with objective moral facts right right like how surprised like how crazy yeah, is we that? shouldn't trust our beliefs to give us true information about morality yeah you know, we right. shouldn't trust our moral beliefs at all e even if uh they even if we stumbled upon a true moral belief now and again it will be like um it'll be like looking at a stopped watch when the time accidentally is correct yeah you can't but you're never justified in believing that you do have the correct time because those stop is the, the watch is stopped right it'd be something like that along those lines yeah, yeah like get your a moral get yeah. your case or something yeah, yeah. that's sweet yeah. Mm -hmm. that's awesome um okay so uh miracles let's jump on to miracles so let's talk about one more uh moral argument awesome um, uh so i want to give a shout out to this family of arguments there are there are arguments for for the existence of God based on sort of the practical or theoretical rationality of, of being moral. And so here we have like John Hare's work or uh, uh, Linda Zagzebski's work. Um, they argue that uh, we need God in order to be rational, to live up to the demands of morality. So um, here's an example. Um, it's the nature of morality that we live up to its demands, right? Um, failure to do so renders us blameworthy. But it seems unarguable that none of us can live up to the demands of morality. That's, uh, I mean, that just seems to be an empirical fact. All of us fall short of the demands of morality. Yeah. But it's a maxim, and this is sort of an indubitable maxim in philosophy, that ought implies can, right? Mm. We ought to live up to the demands of morality, and yet it seems like we can't. So there's a conundrum here. Uh, and this is what John Hare calls the moral gap. Uh, we ought to live up to the demands of morality, but it seems that none of us can. So what's the explanation? Well, Hare and Zagzebski and others, they offer an elegant solution. They say we we indeed can live up to the demands of morality. Ought and ought does indeed imply can. Only if we have the assistance of a loving God that cares for our mor moral formation, and, and in particular, one that offers guidance, sanctification, forgiveness, atonement and so forth and so forth so it's these extra sort of divine assistance uh categories of, ass of assistance that are necessary for us to live up to the demands of morality and fulfill that that sort of maxim of morality ought implies can 
kind of a cool argument. I just yeah, that is kind of cool. Um, it, does that is that like Otten Pies can star like, not not quite, but like Otten Pies can given like theistic help, divine help. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless you think that all of our moral experience just undermines this, what seems to be an axiomatic principle of morality, ought implies can, yeah. then we have, we have to have some sort of explanation, uh, something that explains our moral failings, uh, how that's consistent with this principle, ought implies can. Yeah. Mm. And it seems like we need extra human assistance, uh, is I think uh, Zach Zepsi's terms, yeah. Yeah. If we can't do it on our own, well, we we, we gotta we gotta look elsewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm fighting all my my reformed bro uh, inclinations to be like, well, Auden Pies, I don't know, I'm totally yeah. depraved, and um, but no, I yeah, I like it because it's it hasn't totally triggered me because we went yeah. with the theistic. Yeah, that's good. Well, let me let me throw another one at you, um, just because I think that, that moral arguments, other than sort of like Craig style arguments, they don't they don't get a lot of attention. So yeah. Here, Here's another lesser known moral argument uh, from John Henry Newman. He, and it's his argument from moral conscience. He says, uh, he draws attention to the fact that we're off, we often feel guilty for things that we do in secret, uh, things that, e even things that we could get away with, you know, and, and they harm no one else. Yeah. Um, but why should we feel guilty for such things? Uh, it seems like guilt, shame, responsibility, these sorts of moral emotions, they're only appropriately felt in relation to other moral agents. Mm -hmm. um, but Newman's point is that when it comes to like deeds done in secret that hurt no others, uh, or that we can get away with feelings of guilt and shame, they're appropriate only if there's another moral agent that's privy to those deeds done in secret. Uh, uh so yeah. And that can only be the, be the case if that, if that agent is omnipresent, omniscient, a moral judge, uh, a godlike being in other words. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you could always run like the like an evolutionary argument and be like, well, you know, we evolved. Mm -hmm. it, it helps the tribe if we all think that there's uh, a, yeah. 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 So maybe we're just all socially conditioned to have those sorts of feelings. But if that's true, I mean, why not think that we could just as well socially condition ourselves out of those feelings? Right. Uh, is, it, is it is it more likely that our conscience is it seems maybe like it's more likely that our conscience is, is something hardwired. Mm. Uh and shouldn't be ignored, uh, but port points to a deeper reality. Anyway, that was uh, John Henry Newman's argument. I mean, it's yeah. a an intriguing argument, but yeah, you you would go to like the social conditioning, evolutionary conditioning route. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like it though. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. again, it's like C.S. Lewis. -y. Like you start mm -hmm. messing with some stuff yeah. and the rest falls apart. And it's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have messed with that at all. Maybe right. it was designed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. Um, all right, now we can get to miracles, right? Let's go miracles, yeah. And this is one, dude. I just never touch this ever, um, and probably because I'm a product of my modern environment, where it's like, oh, you know, like miracles. Yeah, I, I believe they happen. You know, I think I've mm -hmm. I, maybe I've experienced some of the stuff, but I wouldn't use those in arguing with someone. And so I'm glad that you included this on here, because that's something I need to I need to grow in. Well, I sympathize with what you're saying, and I. And I guess I got to add that I don't think there's much of a chance that arguments from miracles are going to go very far with philosophy. Okay. okay. Um, most philosophers are just going to repeat uh, what Hume has to say about this. Uh, they'll dismiss it based on like general philosophical human reasons. Uh, but really the deeper reality is that uh, the only proper way to engage arguments from miracles is to do the historical investigative spade work on the miracle claims themselves yeah philosophers generally are just either too lazy or disinterested to do that kind of work they want to sit in their in their thinking chair and assess arguments that way they don't want yeah. to actually crack open history books and do all that kind of stuff so yeah. i i understand why this is this is not an argument category of argument that would appeal to philosophers yeah mm -hmm. and i've just kind of souped up my my armchair uh i, I really like I really like armchair stuff. I've talked with Timothy Williamson and he's like the defender mm. of the armchair. And I was like, okay, cool. We can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So I'm always like someone else can, can handle the miracle stuff. And I will just, I'll see if, uh, it's just, if, if testimony works, I'll go with the epistemological uh, run. Can I trust them? Okay, cool. Evidence of evidence is evidence. And here we go. Right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. So we got that classical, uh, misconception. Um, but there's a, there's a few classical misconceptions, oh, right? A lot, a lot of misconceptions about, 
arguments for miracles. I don't know if you want to camp out on these or we'll just list them and move on. Because... Yeah, let's let's do that. Let's list them and move on. Okay. So, you know, classic one is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. The short response is just read John Ehrman's book, Hume's Abject Failure. Mm. Uh, classic misconception. Argu uh, miracles reported in a text have to assume the general reliability of that text. It's yeah. not true. Um, arguments from miracles should come after arguments from theism generally. So we can't even talk about miracles before we've established that, you know, maybe God exists. And that's kind of an apologist thing that, or it has yeah. been before, right? Where yeah. apologists go, Oh, I have two steps. First step is established. Right. God, then I can get into other stuff. That's right. But there's a real, there's a real flaw in this. And, uh, Sandra Minson and Andrew Sullivan point this out. They say, you know, it'd be odd if, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It'd be odd if they considered information-rich signals from outer space as potential evidence for extraterrestrials only after they mm. have independent evidence for the existence of extraterrestrials, right? Yeah, that's so good. Maybe the signals themselves might be the best evidence. Uh, and so, likewise, they point out, it's like, maybe divine revelation in the form of miracles is the best evidence we have of God's existence. Yeah. And they'll be the foolish to consider that evidence uh, only after we have, you know, general evidence for God's existence. Uh, God's existence just sort of comes for free by implication uh, in arguments from miracles. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that one. Yeah. Um, and it kind of works with like, yeah, it kind of works with like divine revelation a little bit, I think, too. Like you could go on that route. And that that's, uh, I think that's part of the contemporary development, right? Arguments from prophecy. Prophecy. There's some pretty cool work being done on this. Of course, that was some of the earliest Christians' favorite arguments is arguments from prophecy. But Lydia McGrew has a really cool paper in Philosophia Christi yeah. where she looks at the messianic prophecies of Psalm 22 and, and Isaiah, Isaiah 53, uh, which are, of course, apparently fulfilled by Jesus. No one disputes that these texts were written uh, hundreds of years before uh, before Jesus. Um, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls confirm that. Right. Uh, it's and it's dubious that the gospel writers could forge the core details of Jesus' death. Uh, and so McGrew, you know, of course, in, in good McGrew fashion, probabilistic fashion, she considers the extent to which the historical evidence confirms the hypothesis about about these prophecies, uh, uh, confirms the hypothesis that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah. Mm. And she estimates that the evidence confirms that hypothesis over its negation by a factor of, 25 million. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to if you want to read her arguments wild. from that figure, go go look at that paper in Philosophia Christi. That's awesome. Yeah, she's a the McGrews, man, the whole family. They're they're beasts. Oh yeah, they're yeah. they're approaching like alien status, yeah. Yeah. I uh to mention uh D digital gnosis again. He's got this really funny uh this really funny thumbnail of the McGrews and it's like uh um probability machine goes brr cuz like they, <laughs> these guys are bayesian or maybe yeah, Bayes, Bayes machine goes I don't know I don't know what sort of genetics are going on there with that for real calculate yeah th those are th th yeah they're just straight up uh, calculator brains that's seriously cool. mm -hmm. yeah so so that's some that's some really cool stuff um and i i, I like when people start messing like bringing in uh, divine revelation because because even as we started out we were talking about you know natural theology uh, and distinguishing it from special natural revelation from special revelation or natural theology from um you know uh direct divine uh revelation i just i, I love when you start mixing and matching and uh because i mean that's that's a big part of the reason for why i believe is the mm -hmm. bible right so i like to i like when people start messing with that stuff uh yeah. And I'm and I'm glad the McGrews are doing what they're doing too. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so next up, our next category is experiential. Um, yeah, experiential yeah. arguments. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, um, we don't. What What do we mean? I guess by experiential. Oh, it's just a it's just a category category of arguments based on religious experience. Okay. So if if you have an experience that you take to be of God or something divine. And you come to believe in in God or something divine based on that experience. This this is and and really sometimes the experiential category is not even presented as an argument. It's just an experience, right? But you know the the, the literature on 
the argument from religious experience, you know, the whole point there is that they, they're actually trying to massage or finesse how you can get an argument from these experiences. Mm. Um, and everyone thinks of William Alston, Alvin Plantinga, and Richard Swinburne here, but the real pioneer of this work, you know, in terms of massaging religious experiences into, into actual philosophical argument, is John Hick. Mm. As far as I can tell, it's John Hick. He was one of the first to explicitly argue for a strong parity between religious experience and other experiences that we have that we take to be reliable. Hmm. So it's sort of like a, a either both are bad or both are good kind of argument. That's pretty uh, sweet. Yeah. But, so he, go ahead. Do you know if that predates like his, I don't know, deconversion or his conversion to like oh yeah pluralism? That, that predates it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, and he argued, and well, it's also consistent with with his uh, deconversion as well. Well, so uh, that 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 kind of opens up some some that goes back to like what what are the arguments proving, right? Because it's like if Hick thought mm -hmm. if he, if Hick continued on with that and, and said no, this is an argument for a religious absolute, which is not right. what we you know what we would want to say is theism. Yeah. So there's a big debate in the literature on arguments from religious experience. Uh, as to the sort of like how detailed can the content of the experience, how detailed is the content of the experience? And are you just reading into that experience, your own, the sort of three theoretical framework that you already have, right? You're bringing that, that's sort of like a conceptual overlay on the experience itself. That's, that's not, that goes beyond uh, what the experience delivered. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a big debate in, in, in this literature. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is this is another one where it's like, yeah, I, <clears throat> this is another one that's like, man, um, really strong for me, strong evidence for for me. Like, I think mm -hmm. that I do have a relationship with God, but it's another one where it's like, I often don't find myself like, hey, here's why you should believe because I had this experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this goes to a misconception about these sorts of arguments. Hmm. Is that um, most people just seem to s assume that arguments from a religious experience have evidential force only for the person who has, who's had the experience. Right. Uh, and, and obviously there's more evidential force for the person who had the experience. Yeah. But what this misses is that religious experiences can function as essentially as testimonial evidence, like you said, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, which can be very powerful to a broader audience. And uh, Keith Yandel, he gives us this cool example. He says, mm -hmm. uh, suppose scientists, report discovering giant squirrels in northern minnesota well yeah that would be unusual but if you have no reason to mistrust the scientists and you've never been to northern minnesota yourself well you now have evidence that there's giant squirrels in northern minnesota don't you uh, yeah. and your and evidence increases with the number of people who said they saw giant squirrels in northern Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, so uh, mutatis mutandis, right, with the argument from religious experience. People who are otherwise trustworthy hmm. report experiences of God. A lot of people in various cultures, in various times, in various backgrounds, and of various socioeconomic status. And so this is essentially a very strong argument from testimony on the basis of religious experience for the reality of something divine, if not a God. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I guess in, like, barring... Um... Like a like a strong error theory or or you know reason to mistrust like oh uh, well yeah whatever it is like there's a uh, swamp gas in northern Minnesota that appears <laughs> uh, squirrely uh, like giant giant squirrel like to those who are under its uh, yeah right so yeah. the problem with the error theory or debunking style argument debunking is, yeah is going to be uh, your your sites have to be trained they have to be your the, the weapon has to be trained on just religious experience and it mm. can't it can't blow up perceptual experience in the process right right that that was the hick thing that's that's yeah. what he started like sauce for the goose right. sauce for the yeah that's exactly right and and so that's where william alston and richard swinburne come in and they say well no there seems to be this parallel between sense experience in general and religious experience they're both justified in the same way they both have the same epistemic structure so it seems like they both have to either come together or go go together. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. That's good, man. I like that. Um, I think I usually have an aversion to this because I hear like, 
I don't know, Sam Harris will bring up something like, well, there's this guy in India who produces candy and ash and stuff. And like, all right, man, I don't want that evidence. I'm not going to listen. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, you know, but, I don't, I don't really understand it. It's like, you know, there are colorblind people too. Does that undermine my visual perception of colors? Right, right, right. That's, 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 that's what you were just getting at. Like, I was just thinking through that, like, okay, there's a lot of different religious experience mm -hmm. going in all different directions. But there's a lot of, I don't know, I guess you'd say like, hey, look, we don't all see random like pink elephants and stuff like that or purple elephants. And like if we did, then we would doubt our uh, regular experience more often. But but here on the religious side, we are getting, you know, pink elephants and all sorts of random different, um, not not random, but um, incommensurate uh, data or something. Well, right? to some degree, uh, and a lot of the authors on the argument for a religious experience, they go at great pains to illustrate that there is actually a common core okay. to all of these sort of religious experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and Caroline Davis's work is very good, good on this. So is Keith Yandel's, mm -hmm. uh, where they say that the common core of religious experience has these sorts of properties and here's what you can deduce. Um, I don't have, I don't have that yeah. in front of me on, on what all they say. But it usually has something to do with there is a transcendent reality. I'm small and compared to it. I'm I'm a moral failure. <laughs> uh, things like that. Yeah, well, that's good. This this shows like the armchair uh, that I like so much, where it's like I'll just go with what seems right or what I've heard people say instead of like looking at the data and finding the common core. So that's good. And Yandel's the man. I love Keith Yandel. So uh, I'll have to jump in on that. That's fun. And I'm sure like. He hasn't. He he passed away recently, a couple years ago. But yeah. I'm sure there's way more since him in his work too, right? So, yeah, I'm excited yeah. to to get into that some more. Mm -hmm. Um, eh, anything else on experiential arguments? Well, you know, I gotta give a shout out to uh, Richard Swinburne too. You know, yeah. he's, got, he's got the simplest approach, which mm -hmm. is appropriate because he's the you know he's the simplicity guy, right? Uh, and his approach is just that. Hey, uh, he appeals to this for bedrock epistemic principle that says if something seems to you to be the case, well, then you're justified in thinking that it is the case until you you've got more reason to doubt it. Yeah. Uh, well, it seems to me that God exists. And, uh, my, my reasons there are, are stronger than reasons for doubting. So for now I'm justified in believing God exists. Uh, I think that's, uh, you can boil. It's almost like the equivalent of the modal ontological argument boiled down to the essentials. I think this is the, the, argument from religious experience boiled down to to its essentials yeah it was cool when i uh, one of my episodes with mike humor he mentioned this as well i was like i think swinburne had something like this back in the day I'm like dude this is so cool like it's coming yeah. from the mm -hmm. religion and and it even predates humor's uh phenomenal conservatism maybe mm -hmm. he didn't say predates but i think he did um so i hope i'm getting that right um which was really cool to seeing like him prominent epistemologist giving a nod to swinburne yeah i'd like to see i'd like to see humor's response to that argument yeah, because he does go in for phenomenal conservatism, right? That's right. And he doesn't have too many axes to grind, so he might just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. Uh, that, that might be good. <laughs> like, But I have other reasons or something, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. he's such a cool guy. I love that. Um, all right, so so uh, now we got this category of pragmatic arguments, which uh, are fun. These are They're all fun, but I, I like this. I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, classic, classic misconception um, is like against pa Pascal's wager you put here. Um, it needs to invoke infinite utilities. Yeah. So there's some explanation that's required there. Well, the classic version of Pascal's wager is simple. You should believe in God because if God exists, you gain everything. Um, and if he does not exist, you lose nothing, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so utility in, in the context of this, of this argument, uh, gaining everything, gaining infinite utility, uh, you know, an eternal life in heaven, um, well, utility and decision theory context, that's just the expected value of an outcome. Uh, so sometimes the wagers presented, the classic presentation is, is, is the expected value of belief in God is an infinite, is infinite because of the expected value of, of an infinite bliss, right? Yeah. Infinite afterlife or whatever, eternal life. So the wager is often dismissed as relying on uh, the problematic notion of infinite utility. And, and, and granted, Infinite utility is a very difficult notion to make sense of in decision theory. And so uh, a lot of philosophers just dismiss it because of its reliance on infinite utility. The problem is 
there are a lot of other ways you can run the wager that don't appeal to infinite utilities. Hmm. All you need is greater expected utility, not yeah. infinite utility. So if the if the expected utility of belief in God is finite, but still greater than the expected utility of disbelief in God, well, then it's still more rational to believe in God than disbelieve. Yeah, is the is the greater there? Um, is that like a is it a vague concept or like is it like if it's fifty one to forty nine, yeah. then it's you know what I mean? Yeah how how exactly are we quantifying utility in decision theory? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, well, this goes back to some of the original utilitarians themselves. You know, they yeah, talking, right. Like, like hedons, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that. like oh, I get like five hedons from this, six hedons from that. Right. Um, no, I mean, I guess it. So the way you would run the wager argument uh, with quantifying utilities would be the way like um, Justin McBrayer and Michael Rada do. Yeah. And what they do is that they appeal to well-being studies mm. on the benefits of religious commitment. Mm. Uh, and 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 this sort of gives them the quant quantification aspect that they need. And and the studies show that believers, they well, they live longer. They have stabler marriages and families. Uh, they have more social support and contacts. They have higher mm. self-esteem. They're happier. Uh, they're more optimistic and hopeful. They have a greater sense of meaning and purpose in life. Uh, and so they'll appeal to these studies, which are quantifiable, uh, how uh, how good of a life that uh, someone believes in God versus how good of a life that someone doesn't believe in God. And they're saying like, well, wow, look at all this, like this worldly benefits, uh, sort of mundane benefits that come from belief in God that seems to outweigh disbelief in God. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, it's so good, and I, I I've been meaning to read. Is it is it Rada Rhoda? I don't know how to say it. Rhoda Rada. I don't know okay. either. Okay. Uh, taking okay. Pascal's wager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I've I've just heard so many good things about it, and I have it over my shelf, and I have not. Fantastic book. Yeah, it's, okay. it's definitely worth reading. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you so I, that's a that's a modern uh, a contemporary development, I'd say probably right. Um. Yeah, but it's got it's got. Uh, some precedent in William James's work, sometimes it's called the Jamesian wager. Okay. Uh, so there is some sort of blurring of the lines here between Pascal and, and William James. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Uh, the, the eminent pragmatist himself, right? Like that would yeah, make sense right. that he would have that. Um, yeah. But, but in, in another, in a, a more clear cut uh, contemporary development, uh, Creel's argument, and he, Cash, cashes it out in in terms of devotion to God. Is that is that his development? Yeah. So this is a super cool argument that I found while researching pragmatic arguments. That's not, as far as I can tell, it's not really discussed by anyone. And mm. I think it's such a cool argument that uh, I, I want to mention it. And the idea goes that it's for the it's a pragmatic argument for the rationality of total devotion to God. Yeah. Uh, it goes like this. Okay. Suppose there's a there's a local girl suspected to have drowned all right um now it'd be a great good if she hadn't drowned obviously yeah, yeah. um now because you believe it's epistemically possible well, even though you think it's unlikely that she's still alive but it's possible that she is it's rational to hope that she's still alive yeah and because it's rational to hope that she's still alive it's rational to devote your day to searching for her to join mm. this party um so here, here's another example yeah uh, suppose uh, nuclear war seems imminent, right? It's just around the corner. And obviously it'd be a great, a great good, a really great good if, if nuclear war was averted. Yeah. Um, and because you believe it's possible, even though it's unlikely, to avert nuclear war, it's rational to hope that it'll be averted. And so it's rational to devote, to devote yourself full time to trying to avert it. Yeah. Okay, so Creel thinks that examples like these show that the greater the good, the more rational it is to hope for it, so long as, as it's even believed to be possible. Yeah. Uh, and so the more rational it is to hope for something, the more rational it is to devote yourself to trying to realize that possibility. Hmm. Uh, so uh, think of it this way. If the, uh, it's maximally rational to hope for whatever you believe is the greatest possible good. Yeah. It's just sort of like a... Uh, pushing the principle to its its logical extreme. 
Mm -hmm. It would be maximally rational to devote your life to that greatest good, regardless of how improbable you think its realization is. Yeah. Okay, now, here's where he draws it full circle. Presumably, if God possibly exists, it's, you think it's epistemically possible that God exists. Yeah. God is the greatest possible good. So if you think it's possible that God exists, then it's maximally rational for you to hope that God exists. Hmm. And so it's maximally rational for you to totally devote your life to God, regardless of how improbable God's existence is. Yeah. <clears throat> I really like this. I wonder if there's like a parody uh, from the lottery or something. I guess maybe because I'm not very good with probabilities, maybe you could go that route and be like, it's very improbable that you, you know, are going to win. And so then therefore it's not rational, but it's like, yeah, but I, it's not the maximal. Cause I think God would rightly be the maximal uh, good. Right. But it's yeah. a, it's a, it, it'd be a pretty good, good if I won the lottery. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is that it's not very rational to hope for winning the lottery. Right. Uh, yeah, Because it's improbable. Right extremely improbable um and but it's so possible right it is yeah it's, it's as long as you believe it's possible yeah and that it's rational to hope for it okay so uh, that, that's where i'm getting i think that's that's where I'm, uh, I'm lost or i'm yeah i'm uh foggy on the the mm -hmm. argument for for god mm -hmm. then be so it's it's if you think it's possible that god exists then um Okay, that's how we start. It's possible to exist. And he would, if he did exist, he would be the greatest good. Mm -hmm. And so then it's rational for you to hope that he does exist. Yeah. But what if you think it's possible, but really improbable, like yeah. the uh, winning the lottery? Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would want to camp out on, on the rationality of, is it even rational to hope that you can win the lottery? Right. Yeah. I think probably, I would think probably not. Yeah. Um, and if I devoted again, my life, I, maybe there's some kind of devotion thing there too. Like if you devote your life to God, your life's going to be better than if you devote your life to winning the lottery. Oh yeah. And that, maybe that, maybe that's the direction to go with this is that, uh, it's not rational to devote yourself to the, to the great good of winning the lottery. Well, it's, and is the, is winning the lottery such a great good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like like finding the girl suspecting of having ground or or um, averting nuclear disaster. Is it all, is it on the order of those goods? You know, mm -hmm. in fact, we might even have empirical evidence that suggests. I was thinking that. Not. Right. Like, look, at, <laughs> look at people's lives and their families right. falling apart. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, that's a great that's a great question. How would Creel Creel respond to that? Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to really work it out to see if the, the responses that we're teasing with right now would would work. But that's a yeah. good question. Mm -hmm. I really, well, I really like his argument. So I'm hoping that there's not a good parody there. Um, <laughs> and maybe that's wrong. I think that's an okay way to do philosophy, but I, some people will, will hit me for that. Um, so you have to yeah. believe that. It's, so I guess the rub would be, you have to believe that it's a great good, right? Yeah. Uh, and maybe, maybe for the, the lottery participant, maybe they're already irrational in thinking that winning the lottery is a great good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have to think more about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, this kind of brings in some of the protheism, anti-theism type stuff, which is like in the area of, you know, value theory instead of like, well, does God exist or not? Yeah. Like, no, this is whether we, yeah. we think it would be good. Cause some people might say, well, I don't think it would be a good, an ultimate good. Cause maybe it messes with my autonomy and now you have to go into that. So it's another like fun, uh, bleeding edge type, uh, conversation where you could be yeah. like, you could bring in all this new work that's, that's going on in pro versus anti-theism, which is fun. I love that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, sweet, man. So so in closing here, um, we got just two questions. Uh, what good are theistic uh, arguments? We, we talked about like the purpose and stuff like that already, but I think it, it comes back full circle to it. Like you know, what, what, what good are they and then how, how good are they? Yeah, since I think we covered what good are they in, in different purposes that they might serve. Um, they might serve in convincing some people, but for most people, I think it's going to be that it gives them rational permission to believe as it did in my case. Yeah. Uh, they can increase a believer's justification. Um, it's important for defending what you believe. Uh, but, but how good are theistic arguments? Yeah, that's a hard question. But in my study of theistic arguments, I think, 
I I feel fully confident in saying that as far as philosophical arguments go, hmm. theistic arguments are comparable in quality to the strongest philosophical arguments that are out there. Hmm. Uh, so so if no theistic arguments, here's another way of putting it. If no theistic argument is good, then there probably are no good philosophical arguments for any theory. Yeah. Now that either says something good about theistic arguments hmm. or something really bad about philosophical arguments. Right. Right. So, right. So, uh, it's like the, it's, it's like that hick move again, right? It's like sauce for the goose sauce yeah, for the gander. Or like, right. like we, we all rise or fall together here, uh, folks. Yeah. But ultimately I think it's going to, it's going to be the value of theistic arguments is going to come down to broader metaphilosophical and epistemological considerations. Um, I think of it this way. Here, here, here's an analogy. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe theistic arguments are like the currency of a country. A country's broad economic and socio-political conditions will determine the value of its current currency. Right. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with theistic arguments. Uh, if if what's rational to believe, um, in the analogy, I guess it will be if what's rational to believe is is, is sort of like the country, then we have to consider things like um how it can still be rational to reject a theory even in the face of good arguments for it uh maybe there are better arguments against it or yeah. Yeah, yeah it's inconsistent with other things you know or believe hmm. uh maybe the theory has a very intrinsically low probability um uh, or on the other hand uh it may also be rational to accept a theory in the absence of good arguments right hmm. or in the face of good arguments against it yeah. Uh, so, I mean, all these broader epistemological considerations kind of bear down in the way we assess the value of theistic arguments. How good are they? Yeah. Man. Well, you you and Joe Schmidt and probably some more. I mean, my professors and stuff. But you guys have really helped uh, encourage me in pursuing philosophy of religion type stuff. I was always like, I came in through theology. So I'm like, okay, I just need to do raw philosophy to show that I have chops. And then seeing you guys like bring up uh, recent work and develop and, and go deeper is like, it's encouraging, man. This is what I want to do anyways. So let me just do this because it's not as embarrassing as I thought, you know, it's not like, no, this is what I want to do anyways. And don't be embarrassed. By it. Yeah. yeah. They're fun, man. It's fun because it brings in. Why would you be embarrassed about wrestling with the deepest questions that, right. uh, like the deepest thinkers throughout history have, has, have wrestled with. Right. Right. Don't let the contemporary landscape of snobbish secular philosophers looking down their nose at philosopher, philosopher philosophers of religion. Don't let that bother you. Yeah. And I've, I've been encouraged by, you know, even like Oppie and, and other uh, philosophers mm -hmm. of religion who, who aren't believers themselves, who still argue for philosophy of religion and how important it is and kind of seeing it as like, man, this, this, this is a place where there are there's teeth like mm -hmm. what you say there it there's consequences for this if there is a god then that has implications for and ramifications and all sorts of stuff for the rest of your life and i love that uh, ethics is like that but i hate ethics so much that i really want to avoid it but uh in, if, unless uh, i can get a theistic take on it and then i can get you know juicy and, and get uh, in on that deep so yeah so i appreciate you man i appreciate all this work that you've been doing compiling and giving uh, arguments that are shake even ones you don't believe in or you don't you yeah. don't think are very like i just i love that and giving honestly man we, we got to say something about like giving the philosophers their their due you go yeah. in and you say this guy said this back then and it was good or it's worth seeing or you know even if it's not super amazing like it's worth seeing that he said this first I, that's really good i love that because these people worked hard and they deserve the credit for it yeah that's a great point mm-hmm yeah, so um, Chad, man, this has been this has been awesome. Where uh, where can people find more of your stuff? Well, I recently got a website. I uh, put that off for so long. It's just uh, camacintosh.com. And so uh, I think I got I, it pulled up actually. Yeah, I sent you the link there. Yeah, here we go. Look at this. Blam. Oh, so fancy. Okay, so there are two sides to the site. You know, there's the profile side. If you click that. Uh, that'd take you to just where my profile, my academic profile, where I host uh, my work. I, I think I got yeah. all my publications there. And Look at this picture. This is, I stole this picture too, because <laughs> I, it's always so hard to find a good thumbnail of you because you don't right. use your pictures. Right. Uh, so I got my publications there, interviews, uh, all that stuff, if you're interested in that. But Look you know, the, the real value of 
my website, if you go all the way back up, uh, click on that tri the Penrose triangle up there in the corner. Now that takes you to the other side. Nice. Uh, now this is where I'm cataloging all of the theistic arguments. Whoa. And I'm, I'm slowly integrating content here. So it's a work in progress. It's not done. Um, but if you uh, click, go up to cosmological, um, click on that there, drop down. So there you have all the cosmological arguments that I've found in the literature and I've outlined. Yeah. So go ahead and click on, let's just say uh, other. Oh, dude, this is the taxonomy you gave in our, in yeah. our so this is awesome. Uh, so those are some cosmological arguments we didn't talk about, but uh, like click on um, maybe a good one would be uh, actually, you know what? Go, go up to modal. All right, here we go. Wow. Look at uh, that. Yeah. So different modal ontological arguments. If you click on, let's just say Katz and Kramer. Yeah. Okay. So that's the outline of their argument. Oh, dude, that's awesome. You have it just as a drop down. Yeah. And then um, crucial definitions and terms I'll have in bold. If you hover your cursor over it, well, there's none in this one, but uh, so if, if something needs explained, yeah. Or, or if I give an example, uh, hover your cursor over the information icon, uh, and that gives you some information. Yeah. If you want to like follow this up with uh, like where this argument is in the literature, where it's published, click on the book down there. Yeah. Uh, and that's oh where man. You can find it. This is crazy. Uh, this is so awesome, man. And so I've got cosmological done. And I've got ontological, design, moral, and miracles done. And I'm currently working on uh, arguments from religious experience. Okay. So yeah, if you just just play with that. Yeah, this is crazy. This is going to be so huge. Yeah, it's it's taking me forever. It's taking me a lot longer than I thought it would take. But uh, uh, it's been it's been a work in progress, and it's been a lot of fun to try to integrate all this all this content. So I hope I'm hoping that people who are interested in theistic arguments will go to that page and yeah, and get something out of it. This is going to be huge. Yeah, we're we're um. At PBA, we're, we're, we have philosophy of religion this semester. It's like a philosophy of religion degree, but we've just been doing straight philosophy classes. So that's going to be huge for all the PBA students to just go to your stuff and see, like, cutting-edge stuff, see the class. Like, this is awesome. This is this is a, a, a huge labor of love, man. Appreciate that work. That's a good term to use for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, labor especially. Yeah. Well, awesome, Chad, man. This has been so huge. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for, for uh, the papers. Thanks for your work. Uh, collating and collab like bringing everything together it's been amazing um and thanks for, for taking all the heat man because a lot of people have been been going at you too from for all these arguments and it's i love that you got a thick skin there it's awesome yeah it's, it doesn't you know bother me at all i mean what what they seem to miss is that uh just because i outline a theistic argument doesn't mean i endorse it yeah right <laughs> right, right uh but no i mean bring it on baby <laughs> i love that that's awesome yeah. Well, folks, uh, that's going to have to do it for now. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Those who tuned in live and asked questions, that's been uh, huge. Thank you for the super chat. And um, hopefully we can do more. Uh, I'm, I'm always trying to coax Chad to come back on because he's the man. That's going to have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God.